Hey, I'm TJ. I'm one of the associate directors of youth at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Welcome. If you're anything like me, you are sick of Zoom calls and technology and screens. And yet, here you are, showing up today through a screen. And I want to thank you for that. Because today you're not only showing up for worship, today you are showing up for our youth which is a big deal because today is Senior Sunday. Uh, Senior Sunday is a big day for our church. And it goes without saying that it will look a little different this year. This service is pre-recorded, and as you can imagine, the, the rituals have shifted a bit. We may not be singing from the balcony, but we will still be singing Here I Am, Lord, in this service. We may not have our senior sermons in person, but they will still be from the pulpit. And this year's Senior Sunday won't be coinciding with Confirmation Sunday, as Confirmation Sunday will be rescheduled to a later date, TBD, but our confirmands will still be involved in today's worship, as will our Youth Laudate Choir, our Youth Council, and our Youth Ministry alumni, because this is a special day, and the youth want to support the Class of 2020. If you aren't familiar with this bunch of seniors, they're smart, they're funny, they're insightful, they're talented, creative, ambitious, and caring. And today you get to hear from them. <laughs> Many of you have asked me, how is the class of 2020 doing? This is your opportunity to hear it for yourselves. You will hear it in their prayers, their songs, their sermons. And as you will soon see, they won't pull punches. They, they talk about the challenges and grief of this time just as they talk about the silver linings and the hope. So I invite you today to listen, to be present, because even with today's service looking a little different, we will still be upholding an important Westminster tradition and worship as a community. Join us. Come, let us worship God. Come, let us worship God. Come, let us worship God. Welcome everyone to the love of God. Come, let us worship God. Come, let us worship God. Oh, welcome everyone to the love of God. God. You have searched us and know us. You know when we sit down, you know when we rise up. You discern our thoughts from far away. Where can we go from your spirit? Where can we flee from your presence? Wherever we go, you are there in the highest of heaven, in the deepest of places, everywhere in between. You are with us, we are never alone.
we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, parents, grandparents, siblings, and pastors, mentors, coaches, and teachers. God, we look up to those who have come before us, education majors and artists, pre-med students, athletes. We represent both those who know the path ahead and those who don't know the path you have for us, God. We are people very different from one another. Yet still, we are called to remove everything that separates us, including the sin that so easily entangles. In faith, then, let us make our confession to God. Lord, we have not done what you have asked. We have acted against your word when we should spread it, committed harmful deeds against our neighbors, and are boastful when we should be humble. We do trivial things others ask to do, but we do not do the loving things you ask of us. Forgive us for being harsh and cruel in a world that needs love. Forgive us when we have failed to live in your image. Forgive us when our actions are disappointing. Steer us away from sin. Help us to better understand ourselves so that we may work towards solving our personal struggles and mistakes with your help. Give us courage to replace the bad with the good. Lead us to love each other like family, even when that's hard and we don't want to. Remind us and help us realize that truly we have never been alone, are never alone, and will never be alone. You, God, are always with us. Guide us to walk in your light. Amen. Friends, rest assured in this. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. Our God is a gracious God of second, third, fourth, fifth, and infinite chances. God loves us, and in Jesus' name, we are forgiven. Amen. You have heard the great news about being forgiven. So now, show what that means to you. Share the peace that Christ gives you. Pass the peace to those surrounding you, because immeasurable love is not something we keep to ourselves. May the peace of Christ be with you all. In fact, we invite you to take 30 seconds to text, The peace of Christ be with you, to someone who is not near you right now. Go ahead, we'll wait. Call me out upon the waters, great unknown, where he may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, an ocean steep, my faith will stand. with 
Lord, so we may catch a glimpse of your walking in our midst, on campus, in the cafeteria, during worship. We fail to listen when you call, be it through your word or through someone standing right next to us. Open our ears, Lord, so we can hear what you have to say in class, through prayer, during conversations with friends, by your spirit, through your word. Help us to see and hear and know that we are loved.
This reading comes from the New International Version translation of Job, chapter 17, verses 7 through 16. Hear the word of God. My eyes have grown dim with grief. My whole frame is but a shadow. The upright are appalled at this. The innocent are aroused against the ungodly. Nevertheless, the righteous will hold to their ways, and those with clean hands will grow stronger. But come on, all of you, try again. I will not find a wise man among you. My days have passed, my plans are shattered. Yet the desires of my heart turn night into day. In the face of darkness, light is near. If the only home I hope for is the grave, if I spread out my bed in the realm of darkness, if I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother or my sister, where then is my hope? Will it go down to the gates of death? Will we descend together into the dust? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. My name is Greta Minho. You all may know me for being in the choir here at church for the last several years. For the last three of those years, I've had at least one churchgoer ask me where I'm going to college next year, only to receive the, I don't know, or the more common, I'm not a senior yet. To be frank, I didn't have a clear-cut answer until last week. You all are so anxious to see me go, I guess. Well, this is it. You finally got rid of me. I wish it didn't end like this. But, as in the case of Job, you don't always get what you want. I'm not trying to compare everything that has happened since spring break to the trials and tribulations of Job, but you get the idea. For the time being, I'm a senior at Montgomery Bell Academy across the street. I'm a captain of the varsity rowing team. The last two months have been interesting, but being stuck at home, social distancing has provided me plenty of opportunities to reflect on my time in this church. So I'm going to take a chronological approach to this. I was baptized here with my twin, Peter. Being a twin, I'm gonna use a lot of we instead of me here. We went to nursery school here. The only evidence I have of that is a pair of photographs in my house. We went to Sunday school with Martha Bess and later Sophie, where we could always expect to have a good time either watching religious movies accompanied by popcorn or learning more about the Bible through religious games. My mom was one of the Sunday school shepherds, which meant we were regular attenders. We started singing in the Children's Glory Choir when we were in the second grade and the Chiming Children's Bell Choir in the fourth grade. We graduated to the Jubilate Choir, then finally the Laudate Choir, by which point we were the only two in our grade in the choir. I had the privilege to be part of two unforgettable choir tours in Ireland and in Nova Scotia. Now it's all coming to an end. Before I move any further, I want to thank John, Keith, Holly, Alec, Colby, and all the graduated seniors from the past six years I've been in the choir. Nevertheless, the righteous will hold their ways, and those with clean hands will go stronger. This verse of the scripture struck a chord with me because of its relevance. We will grow stronger. The figure speaking these lines also hit home. Here is Job, one of the most unfortunate figures of the Bible. Everything has been taken from him. Yet, he remains steadfast in his praise of God, even though he struggles with his faith. You know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. I think the world in this time needs to embrace this mentality. Granted, as long as it's not a defeatist attitude. Rather than, oh well, he giveth, he taketh away, it's over for me. It should be, oh well, he taketh away, I'm moving forward because he has something great in store for me. This is a challenge along the way. Job eventually had something even greater come his way. The same will happen for the world. We will emerge stronger from this time of trial. But I'm not kidding you. It will not be without a struggle. It may be in your faith as it was with Job, or you may struggle with loss as I have. I've struggled with losing a final season of Rome. 
If you are familiar with the sport, you may wonder, how can he miss such a grueling torture? I don't miss that part. I miss my team. I started on the team as a freshman with only 15 athletes. This year, we had over 60, and my vote was aiming for a national title this year. After putting in countless days of my life to achieve this end goal, it comes to missing out on the final leg of the journey. But I remain hopeful. I believe that my time in the sport is not over yet. There are still athletes to be trained, which is why I'm going into coaching. I hope that you all may have found the silver lining in your lives during this time. I, for one, have had so much more time with my parents before I embarked on my college adventure. I had a circuitous path to college, with a lot of struggle to find what was right for me. I'm no longer worried about what is coming my way because I eventually found the right place after a good helping of failure. What I've learned is, as long as we remain true to ourselves, we can be confident that God will take care of us. Everything happens for a reason. Job, will not let, Job did not let the disasters of his life define him. He moved forward to find, no matter what his friends and wife said. He understood that God has a plan for his life. He held on to the hope that his life would get better, even though he went through a time where his faith was shaken. In my faith journey, I have determined that God has a plan for the universe. So I encourage us all to move forward, knowing that whatever we do, things will work out. Do not let these last two months define anything about you. I've long been thinking about this. As a senior in high school, I've pretty much lost everything I was looking forward to. Prom, graduation, the senior slide. While one of those has already been happening, I at least wanted to spend my last quarter of senior year at school with my friends and teachers. I was even seeking that national title. But that's all behind me now. In these past two months, you or someone you know has probably lost something, especially in these recent weather events. We are all in different stages of grief. As for myself, I'm further along the path than I thought I would ever get while school is still going on. While it's nice to acknowledge what I'm missing, I've arrived at the stage of grief where I have to move on. As I move forward to this new chapter of my life, I look back and smile upon all the experiences I've had, how blessed I have been to grow up in such a warm community. Thank you. This reading comes from the words of Paul in the New Translation of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 9. Hear the word of God. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In preparation for the sermon, I had a lot of time in quarantine to reflect on my personal life over my high school years. I realize now that I'm looking back on something that was far more special than I thought it would be. Paramount during those years was learning, hence the school aspect of it, I suppose. Quarantine made me realize that I actually enjoyed school. Remote learning, as it's called in the business, has not lived up to the hype, and as a second semester senior, it only became harder to stay engaged. As a teacher, do you expect your seniors to work for you after they've already been accepted to college and will never see you again? Good try. But I will share one thing that I did learn while I was on campus. First, to give my virtual congregation some context, MBA has quotations scattered across its campus. One can walk from one end of the grounds to the other and read inspiration and bits of knowledge from figures like Shakespeare, John F. Kennedy, and Yogi Berra, to name a few. Even the dining hall is not saved from these excerpts. And for those of you who have been inside MBA's dining hall, you've surely seen one of the most famous lines on campus. Etched far above the fireplace at the, at the end of the hall, it reads, Strive mightily, but eat and drink as friends. And below it, William Shakespeare. For most students, that is where the search for wisdom ends, as the boys are encouraged by coaches across campus to put on weight by chowing down for all 50 minutes of their lunch period. In fairness, though, these words might be most practical on campus. Yet the most profound message I 
come upon is not found high up on the wall for all to see. Rather, it is found on the floor of the foyer outside. Most people walk over it every day and don't realize it. It reads, live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. Mahatma Gandhi. So in writing the sermon, I look back on the ways that this idea has affected me during my high school years. One thing I realized is that through sharing wisdom, we are changed and we change lives. For each of us, the effectiveness of teaching varies person to person. For instance, something I teach to my best friend may have a bigger impact on him than would my twin brother. Face it, we're twins. Our telepathy means everything he knows, I too know. But to prove a point, the same applies to the Lord's work. One may perform an act of kindness in passing for someone, but that someone sees the kindness as a manifestation of the Lord. Every day, God is looking for someone new to carry his message into this chaotic world, and we may be the ones to do it. The Here I Am Lord hymn is a charge to each and every one of my classmates, not just the most talented. We all are the newest group to take the cross to a new place far from here and be an example of God's grace. We don't have to be the best at anything to make an impact on the everyday life of someone else. If you don't know what this looks like, I will give a few examples. I see this manifestation of God every Sunday here at Westminster, as well as in other places. John Sevenson, Keith, Holly Brecht, and others in the music ministry have made me who I am today. I associate their energy and enthusiasm with that of the Holy Spirit. They spend their time getting up early and staying late Sunday nights to teach kids to sing. Others, namely TJ Piccolo and the youth ministers, work so incredibly hard to make sure that teenier, teenagers stay engaged in this community. I've been going to small group, as it's called, with other MBA students in this church on Tuesday mornings at Brugger's for years. TJ always comes with a smile on his face. It is a time to discuss our lives in the context of the church and enjoy time away from the hustle of school. I've learned so much about life and the soul from TJ and Donovan, but it doesn't stop there. From conversing with residents at retirement homes to a summer in Ireland with the choir, my learning only continued to expand globally through this church. But you don't need to take my word for it. The people in the choir and in my small group always return for more. No one is required to attend each week. We choose to because of the memorable experiences. You would think Sunday mornings wouldn't be the most optimal time for teenagers to get up and sing, but the kids still show. In that same manner, a manner after a long night of studying, my peers all get up to meet at Brugger's Bagels at 6.45 a.m. And even Marshall Summer, who's in college, still comes to participate when he's in town. God works through people outside this church community too. For example, my swim coach has changed my life by sending by setting an example which my teammates and I try to mimic. In caring for his swimmers, his time commitment to the, to the team, he shows his love for them. The glory is never his after a successful meet or even season. I see God in his approachability and unconditional love. Athletes who have a distaste for the sport of swimming stick with it to learn from him about leading humbly. He has directly impacted my decision to pursue swimming at the University of Chicago next year. So as I continue to learn from these people, I have been able to give back these gifts to those who needed, needed it the most from me. During my time in China two summers ago, I was able to put into action what my mentors had taught me about the Lord. In a small village, a few hours from the metropolis of Shanghai, I found myself handing out school supplies, shoes, water, and backpacks to underprivileged kids who needed it. I spent my time engaging with the kids and even giving a PowerPoint about my life back here in Nashville. What was even more amazing though was the program that the kids from Shanghai put together to teach these kids English. You see, the kids in this village were not able to study English like their peers only hours away in Shanghai. Therefore, every Sunday, teenagers from Shanghai would drive to this town and volunteer to teach the younger kids English. I remember seeing God in the outside classrooms with dirt floors. The next summer I had a similar experience. The setting was Cape Town, South Africa. 
While I attended school at the Bishop's Diocesan College for the summer, I was able to apply myself to numerous activities, including playing rugby, attending class, and surfing. One of the less glorious activities was spending time in the Cape Flats, an area of town with townships. Yet, the students of Bishops would sign up in numbers to volunteer their time tutoring kids and playing games with them. God was also there on the asphalt playgrounds where soccer balls bounced off of corrugated metal shacks. Although none of these experiences occurred on Sundays in Nashville, I learned more about God on those days than I had on any day I learned here. Believe it or not, I learned more about God and felt His presence when I wasn't actively seeking Him. But you don't need to travel the world to find and learn about God in this way. It is important that we continue to learn to be able to return the gifts that we were bestowed upon us. In the same way, Jesus taught his disciples, be a role model to those around you and teach them how to love. And then they too will spread love in this world. So let us go out and live a life full of learning. Let us learn and receive gifts from God working through others. Let us give our gifts to people we come across in our lives. While we will never achieve the supreme wisdom of the Lord, Paul says it best in his letter to the Philippians. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Thank you. This reading comes from Judges chapter 11, verses 4 through 11. Hear the word of God. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to Jephthah, Come and be our commander so that we may fight with the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Are you not the very ones who rejected me and drove me out of my father's house? So why do you come to me now when you are in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Nevertheless, we have now turned back to you so that you may go with us and fight with the Ammonites and become head over us, over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight with the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us. We will surely do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the book of Judges, we see different examples of God calling different people to become judges for what we would refer to nowadays as military leaders. These judges lead the Israelites out of dire situations. And the way God goes without calling these individuals theirs. Judges that come to mind for me are Gideon, Samson, and Jephthah. God calls Gideon to deliver Israel from the hand of Midian through an angel of the Lord that appears before him. God calls Samson to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines 
This reading comes from John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Hear the word of God. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For some reason, I've never pictured anything catastrophic happening. Because I live in the United States, I never believed that my backyard would become a war zone. Because I live in a landlocked state, I never pictured my home as being ravaged by hurricanes or tsunamis. Because I'm one seven billion of the world's population, I never thought that a global pandemic would affect me. While I realize that this mindset is unfair to hold, I now find myself wrapped up in a measurable catastrophe. Warfare with an invisible enemy. That alone is more than I ever figured I would be faced with in my lifetime. In a world surrounded by death, struggle, and sorrow, how do we define living hope? Here in the United States, 1,300,000 people have been infected by COVID-19, and 81,000 have died in the past nine weeks. Worldwide, 4,100,000 have been infected, and 282,000 have died. Unemployment is at new highs, even soaring past numbers of the Great Depression.
Small businesses are suffering at the hands of their owners, placing temporarily or permanently closed signs in their doors. Love and grief are communicated from six feet away, both of them looking the same from a distance. We no longer can see the smiles on passing faces as masks are now required in all public places. The number of people entering and exiting grocery stores are taken track of by security guards and gas masks. Aisles become one-way boulevards as distance between social human beings has become the top priority of our species. Healthcare workers now have battle scars. The bruises and indentations from nauseatingly tight surgical masks now mark their faces as cries for help. The rest of my senior year is now reduced to a computer screen, as most things in life are. With prom officially canceled and graduation a steady question mark, I've had my fair share of struggle and sorrow regarding a major milestone in my life being vaporized in the blink of an eye. Here in Nashville, we've been hit particularly tough by Mother Nature's physical manifestation. We were devastated by tornadoes that left much of the city weathered and damaged, the places we once knew and roads we once walked now unrecognizable. That was not the only storm that Nashville recently dealt with, however. On May 3rd, a rare windstorm called the Derecho slammed into our beloved Music City with winds of 71 miles per hour and it left an unimaginable heap of damage in only a few minutes of the actual storm. This left trees decimated and sprawled over lawns and it also cut off the only form of communications that we now have with one another, the internet. As I try to soak up my last week of high school, the power outages have un undoubtedly decreased the amount of contact I have with my friends and teachers at school. Throughout all of the chaos that has occurred in recent times, how is it possible that we can simply trust in God that everything will work out? In a world where death is on the forefront, how does hope continue to live? I've asked myself these questions more times than I would like to admit. As my heart breaks in a million pieces in a thousand directions, I've spent time questioning why all of this happens to humans. Honestly, I don't have a solid answer. I wish that we all did, and I know that as a congregation, we search for one daily. There are certainties, however, that we as Christians can discover when we turn not only to scripture, but also to the ever-changing world around us. This new world feels different, of course, but what happens when we turn our focus to the bounds and wheelbarrows full of joy that are emerging from underneath this blanket of emergency? I believe that hope is not restricted to times of jubilation, but rather the worst crises can actually bring out the purest good in humans. Because News Channel 4 can't shoot any new footage, they have been reshowing old stories from before the Safer at Home Act was put in place, but COVID-19 was already making its impact on our city. There's one story that I always watch, and even though it comes on many times due to the lack of footage, I never change the channel. The story follows a North Nashville woman named Samaria Leach, a lunch lady who has been feeding local children in her community since she realized that the virus would be closing schools and many kids would not be receiving their one guaranteed meal a day. Samaria, with a large smile on her face, always greets the children that arrive at her window that she is aptly titled Window of Love with large letters on the glass. She knows all the kids by name, and thanks to the generous donation she has received during this time of crisis, she's been able to purchase books to give away to the children. She always reminds them to read 10 to 15 minutes per day. The beauty of this story is that it shows the humanity of us as humans. From the donors to Samaria to the children, all of this shows the beauty and unity of the people. That is living hope. In scripture, Jesus assures us that even when the world has turned from him, he will guide us as long as we trust in him because he lives within all of us. Because he lives, we live. Because crisis has struck our world, the spirit of Jesus is seen in every corner of life. Compassion has been restored, and hope not only survives, but thrives. The scripture also reassures us in every way possible. Jesus reaches out and touches us on the shoulder, reminding us that he will not leave us alone. For me, this was confirmed when I saw Samaria's story and the spirit of Christ that lives within her and is shining at its brightest during this low point in history. If we look for Jesus, he is there, and he is good. While I started this sermon with a lengthy list of things that are going on in our world, I would like to finish it with a running list of the ways in which Christ proves that he lives within each of us. There's a whole new level of appreciation for healthcare workers, mail carriers, grocery store clerks, and other essential workers. We find ourselves thankful for our sanctuaries at 
dolphins and jellyfish now swim in the clear water of the Venice canals. Snow-capped Himalayan mountains can be seen from hundreds of miles away in India for the first time in decades. Sea turtles can lay their unhatched eggs on undisturbed quiet beaches. Wildlife are showing themselves in deserted cities and urban areas. There are endlessly long lines of cars waiting to donate food in San Antonio. Adoption agencies and humane associations are repeatedly having empty shelters due to the new adoption of pets. That is all living hope. Allow Christ in, and he will not fail you. Seek him in times of catastrophe, and he will reveal the miracles and beauty of humanity to you. I encourage all of you to reach out and hold the hand of Jesus as his is always extended to you. When you accept him and trust in him, he and his soul will reassure you beyond measurable belief. Welcoming Christ into your mindset will employ his spirit within you. During this time of emergency, extend your physical hand to our local national community. Donate food to Second Harvest. Make care packages containing PPE for our homeless citizens and keep them in your car so you always have them ready to give out. Reach out to your elderly or immunocompromised neighbors and see if they need anything from the grocery store the next time you go. Donate not only financially, but through time and energy to organizations such as National Food Project and Congregation MICA. This is what happens when you accept Christ. You can be the good. Like Samaria's window of love that she serves out of, Christ offers the foods of truth and fruits of being to us. He reaches out to us with a hand of compassion and love pure in his heart so that we'll venture out into the world with a new living hope. We believe in one powerful God who protects and cares for us. God created us and calls us to serve. God trusts us to take care of the earth. God is forgiving and gracious when we sin. God's love is unfailing. We believe Jesus is fully human and fully God. Our Savior and Teacher of Kindness. He teaches us love, He heals us, and He encourages us. Jesus is always there for us. Yay! He sets a perfect example for us to live our best lives. <laughs> we believe the Holy Spirit is the breath of God on earth. and guide to all of God's people. And that the Holy Spirit serves as an advocate for us. Bringing light and vision to the earth. We believe the church is a community where anyone is welcome. Church offers a safe space for people and they are not at their best. While helping others through service. In worship, the church comes together to pray. To learn and to get closer to God. believe in the two holy sacraments of baptism and communion. Baptism is the Holy Spirit renewing and joining us with Christ, death, and resurrection. Communion represents the body and blood of Christ and represents how he forgives us for our sins. I want to be a member of the church because today more than ever it is important to be part of a community it helps each other and is dedicated to God's glory. I want to be a member of the Westminster Church because it's an amazing community filled with people who love God in many different ways and I have a lot of connections with people who I wouldn't have otherwise. Definitely got closer to Gigi today. She's impacted my faith by her mom being my confirmation mentor and her just being at most of the confirmation mentor meetings and having someone who I go to school with be like kind of like on my faith journey with me. I think I've definitely got closer to GG, the church and confirmation. I learned that J J Jesus is fully human and fully God, the peace of Lord.
the church is a community where anyone is welcome. They're always favorites. Your own. Good ear. Good ear. The Lord be with you. As God's people called to love one another, please join the class of 2020 and the Senior High Youth Council in praying for the needs of the church, the whole human family, and all the world. Let us pray. Lord, we know now more than ever that it is hard to keep faith and keep living out your word. But help us through this pandemic to live out your word and to help bring joy to people, particularly through this dark time. That you will hold those affected by the recent tornado close to you and that you will bring light to the lives facing the challenges of the recent power outage. Please guide us to walk with you while we pick up the broken branches and mend our neighborhoods back together. Lord, we pray that we turn to you in these times where we feel so powerless. Lord, we pray for the leaders of the world so that you may not only give them the confidence to lead us forward, but also the strength to carry on once they begin to guide us to where we need to be. Lord, we pray that we as a church can rely on each other through this trying time and find comfort in God's unwavering love. We ask for continued strength and solace for our family in Christ and all people around the world. There are many people in the world that are suffering from addictions and illnesses. Especially at this time when we are in a worldwide pandemic, it is especially important to keep the people in recovery in our minds and to know that they have people pulling for them to have an easy road to recovery. We pray for those who are in poverty and have less access to resources during this time. Help us to support them and raise up our community in need in every way we can. Lord, we pray for the homeless community in Nashville during this difficult time. Please help us support the homeless community during this unprecedented moment in history. Lord, we pray for the earth. In a world that is damaged by war and pollution, help us to come together and act for the good of future generations. Lord, we pray for the high school seniors about to go out into the world. Help them to be good citizens of the earth and guide them throughout their transition into adulthood. Lord, guide us every day to turn prayerfully to you and to turn our prayers into loving action for the betterment of the church, the earth, and all humanity. Amen. So just recently in an online meditation with Tara Brock, I was introduced to my wanting mind, the mind that can't find happiness until some desire, whatever that may be, is met. It often looks like if only I could have blank, then I would be happy. For some, that desire looks like finding love, and for others, it might be seeing themselves as beautiful. The point is that whatever that desire is, it makes us feel as if things are not good enough until it is achieved. When wanting mind becomes super extreme, it can often become an addiction. In the meditation, Tara Brock makes the point that usually if we ask our wanting mind what it needs and why it needs it, it often ends in a universal desire, the desire for eternal love. This often seems what our wanting mind really wants, under substitutes like the desire to find a loved one. So for the offering today, instead of giving to the church, I ask that you give to yourself. Fill yourself with gratitude. Thank yourself for all that you have done and offer yourself perfect love. One of my favorite meditation teachers once said, all you need is already within you. Only you must approach yourself with reverence and love. Self-condemnation and self-distrust are grievous errors. Your constant flight from pain and search for pleasure is a sign of the love you bear for yourself. All I plead with you is this, make love of yourself perfect. So tonight, imagine what your wanting mind desires and then try to tell yourself you have all that you need. Offer yourself love because it is all that you desire and make that love perfect. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your eternal love and kindness, no matter our actions or thoughts. Thank you for your acceptance and tolerance to all people despite our differences. Thank you for your forgiveness, even when we are ignorant or make mistakes. Thank you, Lord, for the losses we have experienced and the tears we have shed. They have deepened our love for you and reminded us that you are our greatest gain. Lord, thank you for springtime. Thank you for painting our earth green and filling it with blue jays, flowers, and the sun. 
We thank you for believing in us to protect and conserve your creation. Lord, thank you for the uncertainties we have experienced. They remind us that we are stronger and more capable than we think. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to learn and go to school and the community and support that comes with it. Lord, thank you for giving us life and thank you for believing that we will not take it for granted. And finally, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me the strength to fight and speak up. Thank you for giving me the confidence to be me, to feel good in my own skin, for making me feel worthy. And thank you for showing me how to love myself. Even more, thank you for making that love perfect. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. 
Psalms 27, 14. Don't let anyone look down on you because you were young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. 1 Timothy 4.12 I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Isaiah 41.10 Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God in heaven. From Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 25. Sing.